my name is Henry Hilliard and today I'm going to look at inspiratory muscle warm-ups and their effect on endurance sport performance. Firstly, I'm going to outline the respiratory system, then have a look at how inspiratory muscle fatigue can affect performance. After that, I will show you how to warm up these inspiratory muscles and how this affects sporting performance. Finally, I will summarise and conclude what I have found. There are three groups of respiratory muscles that make up the ventilator pump. The diaphragm, the ribcage muscles, which include the intercostal muscles, the posternal muscles, the scalene and neck muscles, and the abdominal muscles. It has been concluded by many studies that inspiratory muscle fatigue results in a decrease in endurance sport performance. This fatigue appears to be due to an interaction of diaphragmatic work combined with increased blood flow competition with the locomotor muscles and the increased production of metabolic byproducts. Let's look at the competition of blood flow in a little more detail. Shear et al. stated that metabolites which are associated with fatigue and muscle contractions in the respiratory system have been shown to induce a time-dependent increase in sympathetic nerve activity, leading to elevated vasoconstriction in legs and reducing muscle blood flow. This is due to a constant battle between respiratory muscle and lower limb muscles in their fight for blood flow. This is known as the respiratory muscle metabareflex. The metabareflex is important during conditions of very intense exercise, as data from Chiapa et al. has indicated that leg muscle blood flow is compromised when respiratory work is added during exercise. Let's have a look at how the use of inspiratory muscles can affect endurance performance. A study by Vutrich and Notter investigated whether inspiratory muscle fatigue would compromise exercise performance, more specifically cycling performance via increased quadricep muscle fatigue. Healthy subjects cycle to exhaustion at 85% maximal work output with prior induced inspiratory muscle fatigue or without. The time to exhaustion for the induced fatigue group was significantly reduced by 14%. Furthermore, looking closer into the lower limb muscles and their fight for blood flow, results showed that reduction of quadricep contractility was greater when inspiratory muscle fatigue took place prior to exercise, thus agreeing with the metabareflex theory mentioned earlier. Another study by Roma et al. looked at the effect of inspiratory muscle work on fatigue of locomotor muscles. Male cyclists exercised above 90% peak O2 uptake to exhaustion, which was the control. The participants also exercised for the same duration and power output as the control, but force output of the inspiratory muscle was reduced by 56%. Subjects also cycled to exhaustion on two separate occasions, while the force output of the respiratory muscles was increased via inspiratory resistive load. This was to determine the between-day reliability of the effects of increasing respiratory muscle work on limb fatigue. It was found that quadricep twitch force was reduced immediately after control. This reduction was attenuated following a decrease of force output of the inspiratory muscles. Therefore, this has established that locomotor muscle fatigue is, in part, due to respiratory muscle fatigue. As I have shown, there are loads of evidence to show that inspiratory muscle fatigue largely affects endurance sport performance. Therefore, it makes sense to warm up these respiratory muscles to increase their resistance to fatigue. In the next part of this video, I will be showing you exactly how to warm up these muscles and the benefits of doing so. It is believed that inspiratory muscle warm-up improves maximal inspiratory pressure, also known as MIP. Measurement of MIP is a simple, quick and non-invasive procedure for determining the index of inspiratory muscle strength. It has been widely agreed that the greater the inspiratory muscle strength, the better the endurance sport performance. So how does an individual warm up their inspiratory muscles and what devices are used? The Power Breathe is a pressure threshold device that requires continuous application of inspiratory pressure. Throughout inspiration for the inspiratory regulating valve to remain open while it allows unrestricted expiration. Another pressure threshold device is the Ultra Breathe. This device is slightly different to the Power Breathe as there is a resistance on inspiration and expiration. Therefore, this device looks to improve expiratory muscles as well as inspiratory muscles. Now let's look at a few studies and what they concluded for inspiratory muscle warm-up and its effect on endurance sport performance. The first study we are looking at is Tong and Fu. This study looked at the effects of an inspiratory muscle warm-up on intense intermittent run to exhaustion. 
well-trained male participants performed three identical maximum dynamic inspiratory muscle function tests and a yo-yo test. One did not involve an inspiratory muscle warm-up, the other two with inspiratory muscle warm-ups. One with an inspiratory pressure threshold equivalent to 15%, which acted as a placebo, and one with an inspiratory pressure threshold equivalent to 40%. This preceded a standardised warm-up exercise including a self-paced 5-minute moderate treadmill run. 10 minute self selected stretching, followed by ground running at a self selected pace. Results showed that there was no difference between control and placebo groups in the yo yo test, but the inspiratory muscle warm up was significantly higher than both 19% higher than the control and 13% higher than the placebo. Additionally, maximum inspiratory pressure, the peak force we can generate, increased for the inspiratory muscle warm up although this is a transient effect and will probably return to baseline in around 15 minutes. Even though results show that respiratory muscle warm-up does improve an intense intermittent run to exhaustion, there are a few things we must discuss. Firstly, the whole body warm-up was chosen by the subjects, therefore it may have been done in a way that impaired subsequent performance. Secondly, the warm-up time would have differed due to the inclusion of the inspiratory muscle warm-up Subjects would have in fact had more recovery time during the inspiratory muscle warm-up procedure. Finally, there are a couple of questions that need to be asked. First, is the warm-up a validated optimum warm-up for the yo-yo test? And secondly, doesn't static stretching actually impair the performance of a yo-yo test? A different study that also looked at an inspiratory muscle warm-up and its effect on cycling time trial performance is Johnson et al. 10 cyclists performed a 10 km time trial and 3 further time trials, which were preceded by no warm-up, a cycling-specific warm-up consisting of 3 5-minute bounce at 70, 80 and 90% of the gas exchange threshold, or a cycling-specific warm-up preceded by an inspiratory muscle warm-up consisting of 2 sets of 30 inspiratory efforts at 40% MIP. MIP was measured during all three procedures at the start and after eight minutes, which was either after rest or the inspiratory muscle warm-up, dependent on the procedure. Once the first MIP was measured, the timeline was fixed at 30 minutes for all three procedures. Results showed no significant difference between psych and IMW when looking at time trial performance time, although both were faster than the control, with psych being 1.6% quicker. Physiological responses such as breathing pattern, heart rate and blood lactate as well as perceptual responses such as leg discomfort was not different between psych and IMW. MIP increased after the inspiratory muscle warm up by 8% but returned to baseline levels following the time trial. It was in concluded that an inspiratory muscle warm up did not improve a 10 km time trial compared to a whole body warm up. Therefore, these results conflict with the study performed by Tong and Fu, and we will discuss why this may be the case. Firstly, Johnson et al. designed an appropriate warm-up for a 10km time trial, as opposed to Tong and Fu, who allowed their subjects to do their own warm-up, which was not appropriate for a yo-yo test. Secondly, Johnson's warm-up procedure was 30 minutes long for all three procedures, thus the recovery period did not differ, contrasting with Tong and Fu, which had differing recovery periods dependent on the procedure. This may have affected results as recovery duration may affect subsequent exercise performance. Finally, the conflicting results may depend on the exercise modality, as a yo-yo test and a 10km cycling time trial are two very different forms of testing. So, to conclude, looking at all the evidence, I believe that an inspiratory muscle warm-up does improve in endurance sport performance if you were to compare it to not doing an appropriate warm-up. However, I feel that an inspiratory muscle warm-up is not needed if an appropriate whole body warm-up is performed before the sporting performance. Thank you for watching.